And that's why when Italy, in a ill-considered experiment, decided to make using ChatGPT or other AIs illegal briefly, the productivity of Italian programmers dropped by 50%. Joining us today is Dr. Jay Storrs Hall, an expert in the field of nanotechnology and computer science, and is the author of the book, Where Is My Flying Car? Thank you so much, Dr. Hall, for joining us. Happy to be here. In your book, Where Is My Flying Car? You say that functional flying cars existed in the 1930s, but hopes of mass adoption were crushed by the Great Depression and World War II. Your book uses flying cars as a symbol of our untapped potential. Today, the absence of flying cars, along with other advanced technologies you cite, is often due to regulatory, political, or cultural reasons rather than economic or technological. What is the story and the origins of the first flying car in the 1930s? The first flying car, the guy who founded the company that ultimately became Eastern Airlines. And he got the bug and he says, okay, I'm going to build flying cars for the public. And the thing that he was really into was the auto gyro, which had been invented in the late 20s in Spain. But it was just a cool machine. And in fact, as I went and wrote the book and I, I was studying up on this, I bought one and learned to fly it. And it was cool to fly. And you have to have at least a short runway to take off. But you don't need anything to put down. A hundred times at least, I have cut the engine on the gyro, come down and put it down on the numbers, i.e. the square with the runway number at the beginning of the runway, and not rolled off the numbers. It's a really cool machine to, to, to do that kind of flying in. Now, it was already a pilot, so it, it, it isn't as if you could just walk up and, and, and do that. But the machine itself is just a really cool piece of, of technology. Now, the reason that I don't think it's a, a good candidate for flying car now is that most of the ones that, that you can get, including mine, were made under the existing rules for light sport aircraft, which means they had a really restrictive weight limit, which meant they had to use parts that were too light and stuff that was too flimsy and uh, engines that weren't powerful enough and, and so forth and so on. The gyros of the 1930s were 300 horsepower, and the one that I had was a 100 horsepower. And it, and it was all because of those regulations. Now, the fact is that I'm not the only one who noticed that. I mean, almost everybody who's flying noticed that. And the FAA is actually right now in the process of changing those rules to allow heavier, more reliable aircraft. So good for them. But, you know, when I wrote the book, that was just the only way it was. So is your gyro that you're flying around, how similar is that to the ones in the 1930s? The big obvious difference is that modern gyros have a propeller in the back whereas the 30s ones look a little more like airplanes with a helicopter rotor on top. And so they had the propeller in the front. But the flying of them is, as far as I know, roughly similar. It can do all the same things. And in fact, back in the early 30s, they had wings like an airplane and a tail. And the reason was that you used the wings, and in particular the ailerons on the wings, to change the attitude of the plane, which caused the rotor to follow suit. And when they realized that you could do just as well by having the rotor hub be steerable by using a stick, then the wings disappeared and you get something that is essentially similar to the ones that we have today. The other thing is that the reason that they didn't catch on in the 30s was pretty simple. They cost 10 times as much as a car and they weren't worth 10 times as much as a car. And in fact, in the 30s, because it was a great depression, you couldn't even get a car anyway. That all the industrial output had been repurposed to military. It was hard to get a car in the Great Depression because nobody had any money. And then as you went into the 1940s, it was impossible to get a car because everything was reserved and you had these tickets where you, you could just barely buy eggs, much less large steel machines. That was a double whammy on the age of flying cars. At the same time, all this work on the gyros, they managed to perfect a helicopter. And the fact is, if I were going to buy a machine right now that I was going to use as a, a car, it would be a helicopter. My airplane did 115 knots. An R-44, the most common helicopter in the world, does 115 knots. 
almost everything is it, same useful load, blah, 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 except that it only has half the range because a helicopter uses a lot more power while it's traveling. But it's a perfectly decent flying car. And so technologically, we could have flying cars. So one of the big things that I did in my book that I don't remember having seen in any of the other books, the one thing that I tried to do because I was coming at it from a slightly more academic economist standpoint was to say, okay, a flying car is going to cost you this much. How much is it going to be worth? And so there's a chapter in there where I sit down and say, okay, just in terms of the amount of time it saves you going from point A to point B, how much is it actually worth? And, and you can go back and calculate something. And what you can calculate is, okay, people make this many trips of this length and they use up this much time to do it. And they're willing to pay this much for a car that will let them do that. Okay. So you can make a guess as to how much it's worth to be able to make these trips because that's what people say, pay for cars. And so I said, okay, so if you could buy a machine that would allow you to make twice as many trips, it ought to be worth twice as much as the car. And that's very vague compared to what's actually in the book and how it worked. But that was the idea. And using that, I sat down and designed what I figured would be the most valuable flying car. And it turns out to be something that looks a lot more like a pocket-sized airliner than a helicopter. But for me, right now, if I had the chance, I would be buying a helicopter and, and doing that instead. The overall thesis of your book is that from about 1870 to 1970, we had the Industrial Revolution where we had plumbing and electricity, cars, fertilizer, refrigerators, air conditioners, indoor plumbing, you name it. So basically you're saying from 1970 onward, you call it the great stagnation starting in the 1970s. And the only real creation we've had since then has been the internet and computers. But in terms of the physical structure, it's relatively yeah. unchanged. And as you mentioned in the book, flying speeds basically capped out in the 1970s. Oh, yeah, and you can, flatlined. Yeah, flatlined. And you're even basically saying that energy usage, that like per key. capita, right? And that's that so. Can the, you? I went back and I said, okay. Now it turns out that increase doesn't just go back to 1870. It goes back to 1700, which is roughly when the Industrial Revolution began. Um, so it's a long-term curve. The way I came at it was, I've always been a science fiction fan, and I was born at the, the time where before school, I could see Arthur C. Clarke and Robert Highland on television sharing the moon landing. Okay, I mean, this was just how I grew up, and that's the world I wanted. And then it didn't happen. And so I had to sit down and say, why not? And so I went back, and all the science fiction writers and all the futurists, and there were quite a few books of just plain futurism, nonfiction that you can find and that I reference in the book. And they all make some kind of predictions that, that you can attach some kind of numbers to. In particular, you can attach numbers as to whether they came true or not, the way they were specified in, in the original writings. And then, and as a sideline, how much energy it would have taken to make that work. Okay. And so you can just put those on the scatter chart, one axis and, and the other axis. And I figured there would probably be a correlation there. I sat down and I looked at all the predictions of a list of 40. It's in Appendix A in the book. And I, I, just, I assigned two numbers to each one, which is how close it came to coming true and then how much energy it would have taken to make it go. And if everybody was exactly right, only to within the range of error that people always have when they make predictions, you would have expected a two-dimensional Gaussian spread in the dots when you plotted those. But I expected it to be a little slightly tilted because I expect a correlation between energy intensity and, and not coming true. So I, I assigned all the numbers, didn't look at them. I just assigned for each place. I, I just put the numbers down as well as I could estimate it. And then I plotted them and I looked and it was astounding that instead of having a, a, a slightly tilted oval in the uh, as, as far as the prediction were concerned, you got half of the graph filled in and the other half cut off like a machete. And the half that was cut off was high energy and true. And so basically, it's as if there was a law of the universe that something that requires this much energy in our culture isn't going to happen. And that was the key. That's where all the parts of the book come together. 
the things that we didn't get and the reasons. Once I got that figured out, then I went and said, okay, let's look at the reasons that it might have happened like that. And there are lots of them. And, and to some extent, it was a perfect storm. The lots of things happened all at the same time. You had the Green Revolution, and there was even a little bit of feminism in there because women like houses more and men like cars more, right? The relative prices of, of a car and a house flipped in that era. But you can't assign the, the, the total blame to anything, even regulation or even any of the other stuff. You can't even assign it to the, the energy crisis because we'd had energy crises before. And furthermore, people had assumed that we were about to harness nuclear energy, which is essentially inexhaustible. So all of these things stacked up together to make the, the problem. And of course, given that I had started out looking at flying cars, I had to look at whether it was actually possible to build one that people would have bought. And I came to the conclusion, having done the personal research in flying, that yes, we could have. But there, there's a lots of other things besides flying cars per se that the energy flatline um, essentially killed and made impossible and so forth. Now, 60, 50, 60 years later, I see a lot of people interested in getting back on those tracks and going back to the moon and creating V2L flying cars and all this other stuff. And I don't think I can really take much credit except at least something you can point out while you're saying, okay, I'm going to build a flying car. But it was at the same time that I did this, that other people basically got the same idea. We lost something and we need to work and get it back and achieve the future that you saw in the 1950s popular mechanics, basically, and the Jets. People always say that we're this technological revolution. Do you think that's true? We've been having a technological revolution since 1700. The trick is, what do you use it for? And right now, a huge amount of technological expertise and effort and research and development has been going into making things more energy efficient or switching from using fossil fuels to using other kinds of fuels. Now, I think that they're completely barking up the wrong tree. If we had a nanotechnology, a lot of this stuff would just be easy and that we wouldn't require all the specific extra stuff because basically in current bulk technology where you're throwing atoms around in millions at a time, even in the finest things that they call nanotechnology, there are things that you want to do that are difficult and you have to find really brilliant tricks in order to make them work. In fact, almost all of our technology works that way right now. On the other hand, we have one technology where you can just sit down and say, okay, the basic pieces of this will just go the way I tell them to. And that's computers. And you can set any bit in your computer to be whichever value you want. And so you can build software out of that. And so your software is exactly the way you specify it and so forth. And it turns out that according to what we several people in the original field of nanotechnology decided was true, was that it's easier to build stuff at the uh, molecular level where you're being atomically precise than it is at any size larger than that. And it's because matter at the atomic scale is digital. Okay, so there's some mistakes you can't make. You can't put half an atom somewhere. Whereas if, if you're larger than that, even if you're working in two atom molecules, you can put half a molecule somewhere uh, and get it wrong. But once you get all the way down to that scale, there's some of the advantages of digital that will accrue to physical technology. And so it was a, there was a bunch of us working on that since basically 1990. Um, and we did a whole bunch of stuff and... The problem turned out that without our quite realizing it, we weren't the only players in the field. And there was a lot of other people who said, we're the ones who are, who are doing this. And we're the ones who are getting money from the government to do it. And you aren't going to horn in on us, even though President Clinton stood on the steps of Caltech and said, I'm founding the National Nanotechnology Institute and funding it for, I kid you not, the same amount of money Americans spend on Halloween costumes for dogs. Okay. Now, it's not a huge amount of money. And yet, in academia, the fierceness of the fight over the, the, the tiny little funds that they have is just amazing. And in the process of that dogfight, the, the original concept of nanotechnology is invented by Richard Feynman and, and further developed by Eric Drexler and then me and a bunch of other cool people, got not lost, but stomped on. 
Okay. And so the best hope for all of the stuff that we're trying to do by being more efficient in energy and using non-fossil fuels and capturing sunlight and blah, 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 every, every other thing you can think of that's supposed to be new green energy would be walking away simple with nanotechnology. And yet the one thing they aren't doing is trying to create the kind of nanotechnology that can do it. And you talk a lot about in environmental fundamentalist and Maslow's hierarchy of needs in the book as to why we've had this shift towards being more energy efficient instead of just creating more energy. Yeah, I was trying to psych out what was going on. And I have that theory and it seems reasonably good to me, but I would never say that's the whole story. And furthermore, there are other people that say different things anyway. So that was just my armchair attempt to explain why we have gotten the people that, that are doing what they are. But the thing that makes me so suspicious of it is that a lot of the time they say one thing and do another. So if somebody says we're poisoning the atmosphere by putting too many greenhouse gases like CO2 and so forth into it, and, and it's true, CO2 is a greenhouse gas, although it's not really a dangerous one. If that's what you believe, then why are you also against nuclear energy? Which is not only completely non-CO2 emitting, but is the safest form of power generation that has ever been deployed on a major scale. And that's just the record. So the people who do this appear to be susceptible to certain kinds of emotional appeals that I don't believe because they're not logical. Kind of reading the book, and you talk a lot about cold fusion, nuclear energy, you talk about the flying cars, and it seems that the two biggest reasons why we don't have these technologies is because of regulatory and culturally. And you mentioned in the book, I just Googled it recently, about the Code of Federal Regulations in 1960 was 22,877 pages, and in 2019, that Code of Federal Regulations is 185,984 pages. And now they're trying to you know, regulate out a gas stoves and, and everything. And it seems like we could have all these technologies if we wanted to, but we have the, I guess we've just got to the point where we have so much kind of overlords above the average person. Yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, there's a process that unfortunately happens to every civilization. You get hardening of the arteries and the sort of codes that, that we use, the federal regulations that you're talking about. Many of them are good and valuable, but once that happens, then it can be counterproductive to, to put more of them on there. And so we have the social equivalent of atherosclerosis going on here. And right now, we're way beyond the optimal point. And you're absolutely right. It, it, there's, there's no reason whatsoever to force somebody to accept a dishwasher that takes three hours to wash the dishes just so that it can save a little water and a little energy. As a matter of fact, even the, the, the regulators finally realized that at one point. I'm not sure the regulators did, but what happens is that, that you have one of these dippy, worthless dip dishwashers, and people will now start washing the dishes by hand because it only takes five minutes. But you use a lot more water and power because you use hotter water and you splash it around and all this sort of stuff per dish. And so the... The upshot is because you've limited dishwashers to being so useless, you've actually defeated your ostensible purpose. And it, it seems to me that the people who do this are as much interested in restricting people as they are in saving nature. And that's just my point of view, but I, and I invite you to share it. I thought it was interesting in your book where you write that technology grew like gangbusters in the first half of the 20th century, but it wasn't until the second half that education took off. So apparently it's not higher education that's really responsible for dramatic technological growth. Oh, that's completely true. Yeah. yeah as a matter of fact, yeah, since the turn of the century, the average IQ of a college student has dropped from like 120 down, back down to 100. And it's not because the bright college students are getting dumber. It's just because they're allowing so many of the general public into the colleges that everybody wants to have a college education because it's a ticket to a job and blah, blah, blah. But now that the colleges are taking essentially anybody, it, it's no longer a, a place for the intelligent and the scholars and, and the people that like to read Greek and Latin and that sort of stuff. And so it's not clear at all what the social value of putting everybody in a college 
actually is. And people are beginning to realize that it's expensive and it does not pay you back for all the work you put in and all the money you spent as far as your job and career and so forth is concerned. So there's quite a backlash against that right now. And I may have been just a tiny bit ahead of my time on it. There it is. So if you're saying that the average IQ went from 120 down to 100, does that mean that they let in a bunch of people with 80 IQs to take that average from 120 down to a... No, they just let in the, the vast bulk of people. At, at the tails of a normal distribution, the numbers of people at, at the higher scores are very small compared to the big heap in the middle. And so all you have to do is just let that heap in and the, the average will go to the average of the population pretty quick. Do you see this turning around right now? The biggest hope that people have is with AI. AI, even in your book, you talk about it as the equivalent of the Wright brothers being in Paris in 1908 when they demonstrated flight after, of course, Kitty Hawk in what, 1903? Yeah, that was actually a cool thing that I do have to count as a, as a, a bit of a, a win in predictions. In this book that was published nearly 20 years ago, I predicted that because that's my AI book and stuff. And, and so I quoted that in Flying Car Book. And, and so it, it ha actually having come true and hadn't even really come true quite to that extent when I published this because ChatGPT wasn't out. But its predecessors, the earlier massive machine learning programs had come out and they were beginning to win things like beating the world champion at Go and stuff like that. And learning a lot of stuff that you have to do in order to have what we could consider a real AI. And so in my opinion, and I'm somebody who has studied artificial intelligence since the mid seventies, we have gotten to the point where we've convinced the public that our, our machine can really fly, but there's a lot more to come. So you're looking at aviation in, in world one or something like that. And so, yeah, right now, the most exciting technology out there is artificial intelligence. And that's nice to see because, like I said, it's been something I've worked on for a long time and have had great hopes for it. And if you want anything done intelligently, it ought to be something you should be excited about as well, because almost anything that's important, you want to be done by the, the most intelligent person, the most knowledgeable person, the, the or machine about that, that you can get. And it, it could be anything from being the president to being your doctor and anything in between, or for that matter, your plumber. You want somebody who seriously understands everything that's going on there to fix things or build things or make things or just tell people where to go. So that's the state of AI right now, I think. Where do you see AI in the next decade or so, I would say 2035-ish? I think we're going to see about as much advancement in the next 10 years as we saw in the last 50 the thing is, right now, about the GPTs, the T stand for transformer. And the transformer is basically a integrating statistics machine that was invented to aid in the process of translating from one language to another. And it does a really good job at that. And any kind of task that can be interpreted like translating from one language to another, it's also really good at. And tasks that cannot be interpreted that way it's not quite so good at, and it flounders around using all the stuff it's picked up from reading 20,000 books or 20 million books or as many books as it would take you 20,000 years to read or something like that. Um, but the thing is that some of the tasks that the, the GPTs are really good at, um, like programming, um, you can think of programming as translating from one language to another, okay? You're translating from English to Fortran or something like that. You give the machine uh, a specification in natural language and it turns around and, and, and pops it back out in, in your programming language of choice. But that's what it was built for. And so that's why it's so good at that. And that's why when uh, Italy in a uh, an ill-considered experiment decided to make uh, using chat GPT uh, or other AIs illegal briefly, the productivity of Italian programmers dropped by 50%. And so they quickly said, oh, we didn't mean that and it popped back up again. But it really makes a big difference to programming if you have that kind of assistance. And right now it still is just assistance, but ultimately it will get to the point where 
It's not just assisting a human, but actually doing the whole job. And in many cases, that'll be fine. The, the question is, we have to have the wisdom to put these things in the places where they're going to be doing good and not in the places where they're not going to be doing good. If you were talking to a high school senior and they were thinking about either going off to school or trade school, what advice would you give them? Is there any specific majors or career paths that would be optimal for this AI revolution going forward? If I'm talking to somebody coming out of high school, I would say, okay, if you want to go into science or technology, study math. And the reason is that you don't know what are going to be the big technologies in the middle of your career. But if you have math, you'll be prepared to jump across the logs and the ice flows and whatever it takes to get to whatever is the top technology of the day once it gets here. I can guess, just according to what I've been studying and what I think ought to happen, is that the three big technologies that are going to define the 21st century are going to be AI and nanotechnology and nuclear. I can't say for sure because you could always have another backlash and all sorts of bad things could happen. But that's my current guess. And right now, AI looks like the obvious thing to go for. But if you have something that is as powerful, but in the physical realm, which is what nanotechnology would be, or something that completely revolutionizes the way we produce energy, which is what nuclear would be, then you really want to have gotten a broad base underneath your scientific understanding. Take a, a broadly general scientific set of subjects and make sure you know the math. From there, do what you want, because there are going to be so many different things you can do that you can't do all of them anyway, and you may be doing something you like. It's beginning to look like it. I would have loved to have been a spaceman, right, when I was a kid. Not a good idea. You know, it, it, there just wasn't the opportunity. It's beginning to look like that might actually be a viable choice nowadays. So who knows, especially in the 21st century, have been some advances to the way we do things that are making things that used to be considered pipe dream impossible science fiction stuff to be like, okay, maybe we can actually go ahead and make a living at this. Sam Altman, he wrote an article, I believe, like maybe 28, 2018, 2019, where he basically said AI would replace 75% of all jobs. And that's why he was in favor of UBI or universal basic income. And of course, Sam Altman is the CEO of OpenAI, aka ChatGPT. People have been saying this for 50 years, okay? And I've seen an awful lot of it in my lifetime because, like I said, I've been studying AI for all that time. I do think that ultimately it will be the case. I don't know how quick it's going to happen. Furthermore, it turns out that life is just as interesting and just as challenging and just as much requiring you to exercise your ingenuity and so forth when you're retired and have an income as I am, than that it is when you have to work for a living. You can actually have a perfectly viable human experience without having to show up at some factory every day at, at 8 a.m. I cannot view the prospect of having AIs do all the hard intellectual work or having robots do all the hard physical work, especially the hard, dangerous physical work. I cannot view that with any alarm whatsoever. The point is, however, you have to work out a way for people to be able to do things they consider important and they derive a, a sense of self-worth from them, something that nowadays most people get from their job. Now, I think that what has been happening over the past couple of decades is at least an indicator that people like doing things like you, for example, are begin to branch out and find their way in the world without having to work for a single established company of the 1950s style or belong to a union or any of the other things that you used to have to be able to do. But and if the financials can be worked out, it shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Suppose, for example, you make a law that says, okay, um, when you're born, the government gives you a robot and the robot will do all the work that you needed to do and take care of you when you were a little kid and then be your income earner when you're 
older and so forth, and you get to learn to tell her what to do and so forth. Now, the fact is that's not actually ever going to happen quite like that. But just imagine that, that there's a system that, that is its equivalent somehow. The future where people don't have to tie themselves down to some dirty job and come home tired at night every day and so forth, and instead are able to do just what a retired person like me can do, that would be just a, a, a gorgeously wonderful life. So the real trick is to figure out how to make that work because humanity as a whole doesn't have to do anything. Humanity as a whole can retire. If we get the robots and the AIs and the machines that can do all the other nasty things that, that humans have had to do, the major danger from all this is that we have that capability and screw it up and fail to accomplish that halcyon future. To me, it seems like if you would have, say, went into a coma in 1994 and woke up, say, in 2024, 30 years later, that you'd be pretty disappointed that the internet's a little bit faster than when you went into a coma. And, of course, I guess you got ChatGPT, which would be like a super Google at this point. I agree with the premise of your book, basically. If we didn't have the great stagnation in the 1970s, we probably would have space vacations right now. We would have flying cars. We would have energy that's meterless. But when you add in the layers of bureaucracy and just different layers of politics and regulations and people that establish businesses that don't want other businesses to take their market share, I just don't know how different the next 30 years is going to be than the previous 30 years. I'm not quite that pessimistic. For one thing, AI has clearly managed to take off in a way that I would not have thought it, it could if, if that, there are going to be that much reactionary forces a, uh, against it. Now, the fact is that, of course, with any technology, there's, there's all of a sudden going to be a whole bunch of people who say, oh, this is horrible. And the reason they do that is they get viewers and, and they get money and so forth. And there's always going to be people who try to do that. But at, at least to some extent, people are beginning to realize, okay, this is just a scam. They don't really have any good lens on the future, and we are not going to all die from Terminator robots and that kind of thing. And the best thing we can do, uh, to the extent we have, we can do it, is to build new stuff and make it work and, and show how life is now better than it was before. And so and the fact is, I lived through the 90s, and one of the reasons that I wrote this book was that I was really keen on doing nanotechnology. And I was president of Foresight Institute, and I founded up a nano company and all the other stuff. And so I experienced firsthand the backlash that squelched it. And so I can tell you for certain from my own personal experience that, that there was one. It wasn't just that people became disinterested or anything like that. that, that there was a serious a backlash. And what I called in the book the Machiavelli syndrome. And this is nothing new because Machiavelli wrote about it in 500 years ago. So that's just the way the world works. You have to understand that and, and position yourself in, in as good a way as possible to avoid it before it goes and, and messes you up. But it is possible. And AI has to some extent shown that's the case. But you know, look at SpaceX. It's reduced the cost of getting to orbit by a factor of 10. And a whole bunch of the other stuff that we're talking about. We haven't cracked the energy problem because there remain a lot of people in the culture who just are scared of energy per se. It doesn't matter how it's made, doesn't matter how clean it is, they just think energy is bad. And unfortunately, that's the legacy of the green 60s and the rest of the intervening years. And it's not even because of the climate, because the, the, the climate only became a, a deal about halfway through there. You know, people were burying cars on the original Earth days just because they didn't like cars. No way any clue about global warming. There's just been this emotional background to the people who think we're saving the Earth. And it doesn't really matter whether they are or they're not, or they're actually being the worst thing they, they could have been, which is uh, anti-nuclear. But they've been there, and, and unfortunately, we have a kind of a backlog of that now. But the best thing we can do is, is, is just figure out a show that, I'm sorry, but you're mistaken, and we can do better than this, and we'd be cleaner than this, and people can be better off than this, and we can raise another billion people out of poverty and, and so forth, and just get out there and, and, and do it and, and show them. I live in a college town right now, so I talk to a lot of kids that are in college, obviously, 
And when it comes up to the subject of climate change, if you tell them that it's not really as bad as they say it is, they look at you like you're a complete moron and they basically won't talk to you. And that's the future generation. I think that's so indoctrinated that they'll... You know, college town, they're going to be the last to know, seriously. In, in my personal lifetime, I have experienced temperatures outdoors, indoors, and so forth from minus 40 to plus 40 Celsius. It's a big range and you hit the extremes when you're doing some kind of sport. In, in my case, tennis in Australia and, and skiing in Vermont. But the thing is that the average years of the planet over my 70 years has gone up one degree, okay? And it still has another five or six to go up to the point where I would feel comfortable standing in some place that was the average Earth temperature, okay? So I'm not worried about it because it's not going to get close to that in my lifetime. Um, now, if you're young and you've been reading too much of this other stuff, you've been told that everybody's going to die because of it, which is complete idiotic. You can go back to the late Cretaceous heat wave where the oceans were a thousand feet higher and there was no ice on earth at all. And yet the dinosaurs were living happily. Even that extreme of warm climate is not going to kill everybody. The, it, it, that little bit is just so completely at odds with reality that, that um, it's not really worth listening to anybody that believes it. But on the other hand, our energy use, since 70 hours, the, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, our energy use has been doubling every 30 years. Okay? It flatlined in the United States and in the other technologically advanced, i.e. Europe and so forth, countries. But at the same time, people in India and China were doing more and more, and China literally pulled a billion people out of poverty with coal plants, all right? They now emit more CO2 than all the rest of the world put together, especially including us, and they're not going to stop. Okay, so the one thing you can do is develop a technology, nanotech and nuclear in my best guess, but we can do that kind of thing. That will allow energy use to continue doubling every 30 years without turning the atmosphere into some kind of horrible soup. Because although our current rate of, of energy isn't anything that looks horribly dangerous, if we keep doubling it to uh, the point where we are Kardashev level one civilization in about 400 years, it will. Okay, we simply cannot continue on a centuries long scale burning fossil fuels in the Earth's atmosphere. In fact, it runs out in, in about 200 years, not four, because the other half of the fuel equation is you can get all the fuel you want, but you have to burn it in oxygen, and oxygen is produced by plants, and plants are only 1% efficient, and so the, the amount of oxygen that's being generated by plants to react with the fuel you have is going to be overwhelmed in just 200 years, all right? And before we get even vaguely close to that, it's going to be obvious we have to do something different. Okay. We could put up power satellites or the thing is, if we put up, if we put solar panels over everything, we're shading the plants. But not only are we shading the plants, the, um, and the plants don't produce oxygen, but solar panels don't produce oxygen either. And they're absorbing all the sunlight and, and not producing what you need, not only for your uh, SUV, but for you to breathe. Um, and yeah, the use of fossil fuels as the primary power source for human civilization is unsustainable, but it's sustainable for at least another 50 years. But that means we have time without panicking to develop new technologies, and in particular ones we already know about, like nuclear power. And so basically anybody who's doing this sort of stuff is just vastly misled as to what we ought to be doing. Do you think we'll ever see flying cars in our lifetime? You can go to China now and buy one for $350,000. There are several other ones that are they're coming online in the United States. I don't think they're going to be extremely viable because the people who are doing them are mostly in California and mostly putting batteries in them, which is terrible for a flying car. But at some point, they're going to come up with fuel cells and all of the work they put into the rest of the flying car, the motors and the control systems and all that sort of stuff, are still going to be completely valid, and then you'll have something like we talked about. I've kept a, a small finger on the flying car world 
And I've seen more flying car companies appear since I wrote the book than existed before I wrote it. Yeah, it, it's moving. I wouldn't put any bets on a specific time because that depends not only the technology, but the finances and the regulation and public opinion and whether or not there's one big bad accident like Newt Rockney crashing in an airplane that causes everybody to get panicky about it. But in the long run, yeah, we will. Do you think if there wasn't the Depression in World War II, we'd actually have flying cars right now? We would have something. Even if you just go back to the 60s, the light airplane industry for private planes had stood back up again and, and started moving. And into the mid-70s, it was the liability revolution in the course where they were able to, you take your 40-year-old Cessna airplane, get drunk, fly into somebody's house, somebody gets killed, including you, because you're dead, the rest of the family can't sue you, so they sue Cessna, which built the thing 40 years ago. That's insane, but that's exactly what was going on. And it led to essentially the bankruptcy of all the light aircraft companies. And there was an attempt, I, I explain it in the book a little bit in this, but the, uh, there was an attempt to fix that in, in the law and it was a tiny bump in airplane sales. But it still costs in, in constant dollars 10 times as much to buy, buy an airplane as it did back in the 60s or 70s. What was in your lifetime the best era to be alive? What was the golden age? in the lifetime of J stores right now it really is right it's now and what's the reason uh, i remember finally the excitement of being a kid and watching you know, the guys land on the moon and all that sort of stuff but i spent my life doing cool stuff like writing books like this and doing artificial intelligence research and doing nanotechnology research and at this point i don't have to work for a living and i'm just having a great time and I'm still dabbling in all of those cool things that I was interested in. And I'm talking to cool people like you. Uh, the world's my oyster. Yeah, right now is it. What do you think that is the reason for all the negativity and pessimism? We have a way better life than they did in 1900. Yet people think we live in some of the worst times. People bash on the U.S. So you talk to younger people or listen to things online. People act as if we're living in one of the worst times to be alive. And, and in fact, it's the complete opposite. Oh, yeah, it, absolutely. It's hard to figure out where to begin. But the main part of that is that over the years, people have figured out how to make money selling scare stories. And when other people are not busy trying to make a living, which is compared to a couple centuries ago, is, is true. We, we have a lot more leisure time and we could have a lot more still. If we, if we wanted to live the way people lived in 1900, we could work 1% of the time. Our technology is that much more productive. But we don't. We want more stuff, right? But anyway, we have the time and leisure to read murder mysteries and watch horror movies and listen to these scare stories. And there is no lack of people who are willing to make them up and sell them and get rich off them. Uh, and in, in academia, and in particular, get famous and highly respected for them, which is something that always really bothered me. But because I always wanted academia to be a place where people try to find the truth. And it's not. It's a place where people go to oppress people with their intellectual achievements, and including their ability to, to craft believable scare stories that aren't actually true. Um, you know, that, that if I had one great regret about life now as compared to, say, in 1950, it would be that academia has, has, has come a long way down. But even given that, I would still be, rather be alive now. Since you actually worked in acad you know, academia, you got a PhD, you went to Rutgers. Yeah. Did you see the downfall of academia or were you never really in that golden age of academia before the Machiavelli effect, as you call it? Yeah, it's hard to say. Basically, if you work in academia for 20 years, you see it happening. It wasn't completely clear to me how much it was riding to a fall of the kind that's been happening in the past few years. On the other hand, I wasn't in academia back in the 50s when it was really an elite sort of thing. And... So I'm halfway between the, the two eras, I think. And yes, I did notice a, a, a slide, but I, it didn't really strike me at the time as being something that was going to be as bad. I assumed 
throughout all my academic career, I assumed that the university environment would be a place of the honest search for truth at the end of my life. And I'm not really sure it's completely lost. I think actually that there's enough reaction among people who are like me, who want to see it be the kind of guiding star for civilization that it used to be, that there's a bit of a backlash there and and there's a chance for academia to reform itself. But right now it's a toss up. It'll be interesting to watch. Yeah. In your book, and you mentioned you, when Clinton had those grants in nanotechnology, but you mentioned basically anyone that had anything that even resembled nanotechnology was applying for these grants. So the people that were actually working on actual nanotechnology were supplanted by the people that were piggybacking. And of course, you see it now, tech companies, everything's AI, even if it has any AI in it or not. Or you saw like WeWork, where it was like saying that as a tech company, even though it's a real estate company, you see it in the private and the public sector. And as money has become maybe more scarce in research, you have people fighting over it, maybe versus say the 50s when you had the Manhattan Project. And Yeah. I think that AI has gotten to the point that it doesn't need federal money. When I was originally in college and for the decade or two before that, when I wasn't even in college yet, if you already do serious AI research, you needed at least a million dollar computer. And what has happened was that for other reasons, the price of computers just fell down in the most amazing going off a cliff thing that, that we've ever seen in technology. And the history of the, the Martian helicopter uh, the one NASA sent to, to Mars, the first thing to fly on another planet and so forth. It was too small to carry the standard NASA radiation-hardened computer. And they said, okay, we're going to throw the dice, and we're just going to take a regular cell phone processor, stick it in there, rather than the radiation-hardened one that we use in all the other, including the rovers, right? As a result, that helicopter had more processing power than all of the NASA missions before put together in that one little helicopter. Okay. It was just the coolest thing. And that shows you essentially just where the, uh, the, the it was just a commercial um, uh, cell phone processor. That's where computer technology is now. And the point is that you can now do artificial intelligence with something that is so much more computing power than the stuff that we used back in the seventies that we're in a different era, and in any individual who's able to have a, a decent-sized workstation can do top-of-the-line AI work. Basically, you swap a couple of GPUs in it, and you're able to, to do productive work that will break some boundaries. You don't necessarily need you know, the, the Microsoft uh, data center. So that and the fact that given the apparent success of chat GPT and, and so forth. There is no lack of investors' money in AI. It means that you don't have to have federal funds to do artificial intelligence the way we did have to have in the 70s and 80s. The same thing is going to happen with nanotechnology when it has its Lamar moment where somebody makes a demonstration like chat GPT uh, or the Wright brothers at Lamar to the point where everybody realizes it actually works, okay? And that hasn't happened yet. It probably won't happen for 10 years, but I still think it's going to happen before 2050. Your book is written before the, the pandemic. If you had to have a chapter updated since then, how would that change the overall thesis of your book or some of your predictions? Actually, if you look carefully in the chapter on nanotechnology, I try to argue for what I call the Feynman path to nanotech, which involves taking a machine shop that you can use to build a smaller machine shop and improve the precision, and then take that one and build another smaller one and so forth until you get down to atomic scale, as opposed to trying to use uh, bulk style technology of the kind that we have now to go directly to atomic scale. Um, and uh, there's some cool things you can do with that and, and play a good stuff. Um, but I have an example in there of the fact that if you're going through all these scales on the way down, you're learning things you need to know on the way back up. And one of the products that you could produce if you got about halfway down that series of machine shops turns out to be the main bottleneck factor 
in producing the uh, mRNA that came out in the early stages of the pandemic. And so it wasn't completely before the pandemic, because I was writing about that in the book and talking about the relevance of a pathways to nanotechnology to producing things like it, it might be uh, interesting to have a look at that because it really is a nice, pretty cool example of, of, of the sort of stuff you get if you go towards nanotechnology um, the way that Feynman originally suggested we did. Um, on the other hand, the, uh, the rest of the pandemic, um, when you're writing a book, you act as if there were a pandemic anyway. You, you hole up in your house and you just do research off the internet and so it wasn't really making that much of a difference to me. How would you explain nanotechnology to a fifth grader? I'm not sure I would try. I, the stuff that... That's just an expression. How would you explain nanotechnology to a layperson then, the average person that that's not safe familiar with? Like that. If your grandmother's old enough, you can say, look the difference between what we have now and what we had when you were a little girl. And the older ones will say, the thing that made the biggest difference in my life was a washing machine. And you say, imagine that you have a machine that instead of taking the old clothes and, and washing them, takes the old clothes, recycles them, and produces new clothes. And all the other kind of things that you expect a manufacturing technology to accomplish if it's able to do that kind of thing. Right now, things are built in big factories and shipped all the way from China at, at ridiculously tiny prices. But that's like the way computers were in the, in the 1960s. What happened in the meantime was that now we have computers in our pockets that are more powerful than those computers were. And they can do stuff with data that nobody in the world could do back then. All you have to do is say, okay, imagine that happening with a factory. And if you have, for example, like I have right there, a 3D printer, you can show them things being built in your 3D printer and say, just imagine that something like that sits on your countertop and can make anything then they might be able to catch on to the idea. In your book, you basically say that if we had nanotechnology, you could rebuild all the infrastructure in the U.S. in a week, Bri bridges, roads, whatever you wanted. And Most people cannot conceive of that. That's a cool thing to people who are futurists and, and technologists and all that sort of stuff. And it's a true happening. Actually, I, I did sit down with Rob and he will confirm that conversation took place. But that is out of the scale where the average person can actually grasp. All you can do is say, look at this expensive thing, a rocket or a car factory or the ability to build a house, right? Even that's about as much as people can generally comprehend. And you say, okay, so I'm going to drive up with a, with a truck and I'm going to press a button and the truck is going to unfold and do blah, 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 blah. And then it, it's going to fold itself back up and leaving a brand new house in an hour. Okay. That's the kind of thing a person can comprehend, even if they don't believe you, but they can at least comprehend what you were telling them. But it, it's hard to imagine the complete physical infrastructure of the United States. When I talk to people, I tend to use the smaller examples just because I'm, I'm more likely to be comprehended as Again, as I say, not necessarily believe. Because in the book, you're talking about building with nanotechnology 10 mile tall high rise condos or buildings, whatever, made out of basically diamonds or having the strength of diamonds. The one thing you can do is, for example, NASA has designed a nuclear reactor that is perfect. They designed it for spacecraft, but it would be perfect for just powering your house. And it would sit in a closet. And there are many other designs that would do the same thing. Now, right now, such a thing would be prohibitively expensive to use for just powering your house. On the other hand, if you had a manufacturing technology that reduced the price of making things by a factor of 100, then it would be affordable. And basically, when you built the house, you put all the fuel in it that you would ever use because nuclear fuel is 10 million literally million, 10 million times more potent than chemical fuel. So you fuel it and it, it lasts the, the life of the house, or at least until you sell it to somebody and they refill it when they move in. Um, the trick is, or, or like flying cars. Again, I was just talking about the one you can, the Yang, the way you can get in China for three or 
you bring that down by a few orders of magnitude and, and you can afford to buy one. Um, so that's why you can expect some of this stuff to actually happen after we get nanotechnology because it, just making things is going to be so much less expensive. The same way the, the Industrial Revolution did. You remember the example about the, the willow jacket, right? The one they found in the ice at Lenbrain in Norway. And, and the archaeologist said, okay, let's go and see how much time, effort, and, and, and resources it would have taken in 1200 to make this thing just to allow people to understand why we were so surprised that somebody would leave something that was that expensive. Okay, basically, to those people, it would be essentially the price of a brand new car to us. Okay, a, a jacket that you can get for 40 bucks off of Amazon. So what happened in the meantime? It was the Industrial Revolution. It brought down the price of making anything we made. And that's the example. Okay, look at that. Then look at current day prices. Imagine the similar drop in the future. And we're talking about building, getting stuff that we consider extremely expensive today, but should not be in the future if we allow the technology to just continue the course it's been taking for the past 300 years. So when will we have nanotechnology manufacturing at scale? That's going to flower over the second half of the 21st century. Like I was saying before, you've got to get to the point where you can do anything with a atomically precise machine that makes atomically precise machines. Okay, and that's something that we were looking at very carefully back in the 90s, and we have an idea about how it would work. Uh, there's a lot of detailed research and detailed development that's still necessary. We thought we would have it within, say, 20 years, i.e. by just about now. But uh, as I was explaining before, the stuffing got knocked out of the, the main nanotechnology research by nanotechnology, quote unquote, research. And so a lot of that stopped. But there are people still working at it. And there's other places that don't have quite the same antipathy towards the, the original ideas as the federal funding bureaucracy does right now. And I think that 20 years later, it, it, it didn't happen, but it's not still 20 years off. I think it's still, it, it's about 10 years off now. So we're slowly catching up with it. So I, I feel relatively confident in saying we're going to have the, the basic capability sometime in the 30s and develop it to the point of being able to do useful stuff in the 40s and then and the 50s. It's going to become the, the dominant physical technology. And for the rest of the century, boom. So what would the world look like in 2050, 2060 then? The only example I can say is look what the computing world looks like now compared to what it did in 1990. You got stuff that you couldn't even imagine. And you're going to get, and computing isn't going to stop either. The uh, computers are going to get more and more powerful. The, the, the software is going to get smarter and smarter. You're going to have artificial intelligence. You're going to have robots. But if I went to sleep now and, and came back in, in 2050, I would expect to see lots of humanoid robots. I would expect to see flying cars. I would expect to see a substantially more stuff going on in outer space. I expect to see a huge amount more of stuff going on in the oceans and all the machinery it would take to do that, right? Now tech machines that do one little simple function are going to be the first kind of things that we're going to get. Um, the one that I talked about in the book that I was expecting as a halfway product was basically a, a, a nano nebulizer that, that, you know, injected tiny globules of fat into a water where they could contain molecules of mRNA, something like that. But that does an actual nanotechnological mechanical function, such as a molecule sorter, would be the sort of thing that you expect to come out of that gills. You're going to flop around the ocean underwater instead of having this tank of air on your back and breathing through this silly mask, you get something that just extracts the oxygen out of the water the way a fish would and takes the CO2 out of your air and exchanges it and you just breathe normally. And there's a whole bunch of other simple little things like that you can do that allow humans to live in far more environments than, than they do now. I, I expect to see more people living in extreme environments like northern Canada or Alaska or something like that. 
I would expect to see a whole bunch of really ingenious little things that made a big difference because I, that's where most of the sort of initial progress in a technology comes from. We're getting close to the robots already. We have people that sort of clanky robots rocking around. They can pick up stuff and move it and they can turn flips and awesome dynamics has been brought out by, I forget which Asian car company. And so they're actually about to start putting the robots to work in their factories. At which point you're going to have some major advances simply because you're going to have a lot of experience with it, which is, again, how technology works. You mentioned a lot of different science fiction books in your book, Where's My Flying Car? What are some science fiction books you'd recommend and some of your favorites? I grew up with what what were considered the the golden age science fiction writers. I've already mentioned Asimov and Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke and so forth. Oh, one of my favorite Science fiction stories actually is about people nowadays wouldn't probably think of it as being so great because it's set on a Mars that was populated and in the same sort of thing that a lot of the early science fiction writers, including H.G. Wells, for example, took the things about the canals of Mars and so forth at at, at face values and and, and wrote about civilizations living on Mars and, and having to pipe water down from the ice at the poles in order to survive and all the canals and all that sort of stuff. But one of the coolest science fiction stories for my money is simply about archaeologists going to Mars and trying to figure out the ancient Martian language. And the name of the story is omnilingual after the use in archaeology of a bilingual, which is uh, a text that has parallel versions of the same thing in two different languages, which is essentially necessary for you to learn to translate into some ancient language you didn't know. And the writer figured out that uh, suppose you had an ancient civilization that was scientific. You could use what you know about science, which is universal, to understand their language. And this was is not only a science fiction story, it was science, because this is something people need to know if they're ever going to do that. And that's the kind of science fiction I like, where, where the guy is actually understanding the problem well enough to suggest a solution that makes sense. Like there's just a bunch of other stuff. If you just read the bibliography in, in the book, you'll find a long list of references to different science fiction writers that I, I used in the text. So it's a, a fair representation of the sort of stuff that, that I read. And I, I, I've met a lot of science fiction authors on my own in the meantime. So there's a picture of me with Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell and stuff like that. But I'm actually not quite as much up on the currently writing authors since I've been writing myself and that kind of cuts into your reading time. Yeah, absolutely. I can understand that. I want to thank you so much, Josh, for joining us today. I just got two final questions for you. Where can people find your book? And then just leave us with a final thought, whether it's related to your book, Where Is My Flying Car, or just a final thought in general. The easiest way to get the book is uh, is on Amazon. And you can get it in several forms. You can get it as the hardcover or as an audio book or a Kindle book. And there are some, and I'm not quite sure what the story of this is yet, but if you're a bookstore, and especially an independent bookstore in particular, and you want to carry it, it's completely possible to do so. Because my own local bookstore, where they invite local authors in to chat with their customers and stuff like that, carries all the, the local author's books, and, and I'm one of them. There's a chance if you walk into a bookstore, you'll find it. My other two books are not as easy to find, although they were in the mainline bookstores. That's the artificial intelligence one and the nanotechnology one. But they also can be had in various forms from Amazon as well. As far as the rest of the, the thing is, first, I had a blast. It was great. Thanks for inviting me. And second, don't give up the ship. The future is going to be better than the past. I know I've seen a lot of it and I know how it works. And I have every faith that the the basic process is going to continue. People's ingenuity is often turned to making life better, not only for themselves, but for everybody else. And the more people we have exerting ingenuity, the more nice things we're going to know and, and and the better we're going to be able to make the world. My dear friends, that is it for this episode of El Podcast. 
Once again, if you're not yet subscribed, please subscribe on YouTube as well as Rumble. You can also find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. We thank you all from the bottom of our hearts for watching and listening, and we will see you on the next episode. Thank you.